How's everyone doing today? Good. Good. Well. That's a beautiful day out. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about Sitka, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. So Sitka is an adult female bald eagle. She came to the Alaska Raptor Center in 2002 after she was hit by a car in Nanilchik, which is a village on the Kenai Peninsula. She suffered multiple injuries from that accident. Uh, she has a hole in her right patagium, or that fleshy part that stretches across the wing. If you've ever seen a chicken wing, it's that skin there. Um, she has a right wing droop, and she also lost her hallux due to that accident. Now the hallux is the rearmost toe. It's kind of like your thumb, it's their opposable digit. Um, her chances of catching prey have been great, greatly reduced because of the loss of that toe, and that is actually why she is here. It's why she's a permanent resident and non-releasable. Doesn't uh, it's not very easy to catch fish with just the three toes in the front. So um, she's been with us now for about eight years, and in that time we've trained her to sit comfortably on the glove to do shows like these. And it's not very often that we get to train a wild bird like this to do programs, so it's kind of something special. I'd also like to point out that it only took her about six months for training, which is actually a fairly short amount of time for a bald eagle. It usually takes up to a year or more. She's kind of nibbling at this piece of fish here. So that's a little bit about her. So if you guys have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. She just wants to pull apart. What's the life expectancy of the bald eagle? Good question. What is the lifespan? Well, in the wild, they can reach into their 30s, about 30 or 35, and that's if they're lucky and they're a healthy individual. Uh, in captivity, we are able to extend that into their 50s. Um, and, ooh, <laughs> the record was 54, I believe, for a captive bald eagle, and I have fish on my face now. <laughs> and um, so these guys are quite long-lived, and the reason we can extend that is uh, because, for obvious reasons, actually, they have medical treatment when and if needed. They have a healthy diet every day with vitamins. And uh, they don't have to face the extremes that they would out in the wild. So, What is their diet? What is their diet? Well, these guys are primarily fish eaters. About 90% of their diet is fish, and any fish within the first six inches of the surface, because these guys can't dive down. But for a fish-eating bird, they are really surprisingly varied. Uh, they will often eat carrion, which is a dead animal they'd come across in the woods, be it bear or deer or even on the beach, sometimes seal meat. Um, so we'll feed them that here as well. And I try to do it a little seasonally, so in the spring we get a lot of herring. In the winter they're going to be eating deer and bear meat a little more because that's kind of what is available in the winter. Um, so, Are there distinguishing marks that make it easy to tell the males from the females? Or? Somebody's hungry. Um, actually, there are no distinguishing physical characteristics, really, like, like color-wise, just size. The female happens to be the larger of the two, and that's kind of how it is in the raptor world. Um, and she also does kind of throw her weight around with the males. Um, females are generally between 10 and 14 pounds, and males between 7 and 10 pounds. And that's how we will sex them here, is by weight. Females also have to have a thicker bill depth and kind of heftier feet as well. Um, the only accurate way to tell, really, if it's a male or female, is to take a blood test for the DNA. So you can't see it on an x-ray either. If they clawed into a bigger fish, could it pull them under? Uh, you know, sometimes that has happened where they will go down, they'll catch that fish, and it is a little bit too large for them to haul out. And sometimes it can pull them under. And that's where they can get in the trouble if they um, breathe in that water. But these guys are pretty good swimmers, so if they can stay above the surface um, and they can't lift that fish out, they'll actually do a butterfly stroke. And it's kind of a really neat thing to see. Um, and she'll do that uh, pretty often when we go down to the river for walks and I let her swim. Um, and sometimes if the fish is too large, I've also seen them kind of skimmy at half in the water for buoyancy and still flying low across the water. So. In the wild, how much food a day would it take to maintain body weight? Uh, um, well, sometimes they don't get to eat every day. Uh, but usually, you know, they can eat about two pounds. So, And then the crop can also hold two pounds of food in the same sitting. The crop is a, kind of 
kind of bulging out on her right now. She's a little hungry. I fed her out in the hallway. It's right underneath that white neck there. It's like a food storage pouch. So. Um, and in captivity, they're going to require less. You know, these guys are non-flighted. Flying kind of burns up energy. So we'll make sure that we uh, keep them on a good, healthy weight. So. Any other questions? Do they mate? here in captivity? You know, they don't really form pair bonds in captivity. Um, and there's a couple of reasons to that. These guys are just like we are. They have their own personalities. And in the wild, they're pretty picky about their mates. And in captivity, we can't offer them as many mates to choose from, so the selection. Uh, also, part of their courtship is very aerobatic. Um, the male will usually fly under the female, they'll lock talons as part of their courtship display. They'll cartwheel and twirl and spin and plummet towards the earth. And then just before hitting, they kind of part and go in separate ways. Um, we don't have the facility or the room really to offer them that either. Um, most places will use artificial insemination. And um, breeding really isn't our, our primary goal. Our goal is to rehabilitate and to release. So uh, we don't have the actual facility for the needs for breeding. <laughs> Just gonna scare her feet. <laughs> Where's my reward? <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, any other questions, or you can just shout them out. So you, there's no concern that she might peck at you. Uh, you know, she is a wild animal, and I I realize that, and I need to watch her body language to know if I'm in a little bit of danger. And she's never bitten me. She's never acted defensively with me. Uh, but subtle things we look for, if, if it's annoyance, so maybe something else that I don't see is bugging her, you know, I can, she could possibly take that out on me. But subtle things we look for are the feathers over her ears or her auriculars. And that's right behind the eye. So on her, she's got a little bit of a dark patch there. If those are held really flat, she's kind of annoyed. So I'll watch her behavior a little better. Um, aggressive posturing would be what we call here a cobra head, where they get the flat top and the sides kind of fan out, mm -hmm. and then that's kind of aggressive posturing. So would I be very careful around there? I probably wouldn't work with her um, if she's in a mood like that. So at, at that particular time, but you can see here she's pretty comfortable. She's got her feathers held loosely; they're not slicked down. So right there. Before it like the room before mm -hmm. where they're about ready to be released. Yes, the main flight. Is everything they're fed dead? Or do you let some mice run in there and oh, no. give them practice? Or? Nope, we actually only feed already dead prey. Um, because these guys are injured, we don't want to feed them live prey because they could you know, potentially re-injure themselves of doing that prey and fear that it would escape out of their enclosure. Um, there are rare instances where we will use live prey and the veterinarians, if they're worried about a bird that doesn't know how to hunt possibly, or they're not sure if it can hunt, maybe it came in young, then we will use live prey and they'll do tests and things like that. So to make sure that they would be able to do that out in the wild as well. Does this, would this bird be able to fly even though she has the, the injured wing? Right, that wing droop. And yeah, you can see that it would, uh, there's actually some little bit of tendon damage in there. She is considered partially flighted. Her flight's not quite what it used to be. She can't really get up too well as high as she used to. Um, but uh, I do make sure she receives exercise and things like that. And she is free wafted, so. Um, if we were to release her or she got away, you know, that hole in her wing is actually pretty sizable. You guys can't see it quite, but there's some down sticking out back here. You guys over there can see it. You know, if that got caught on a branch, you know, she could further rip that tendon out and then her wing would hang kind of useless at her side. Um, and then she's not symmetrical like she used to be, so.